Hello, Beth. Welcome to Off the Top. So, the rules are kind of simple. I'm going to ask you questions, and hence the name Off the Top. Think of these questions off the top of your head. Okay, let's go. What is your idea of perfect happiness? In bed with my dogs on a stormy night, or above tree line watching Pika. Which living person do you admire? Oof. Boy, that's a tough one. Uh, Yvonne Chouinard or Bono? <laughs> Which words or phrases do you most overuse? That's interesting. If you were to die and come back as a person or a thing, what would it be? Oh, a marmot, definitely. They hibernate eight months of the year, and the three months they're out, they just lay on rocks in the sun. What do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? Oh, anything with big crowds. I just don't like big crowds. Not being able to get away from people. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <sighs> what do you most value in your friends? Honesty. What profession other than your own would you not like to attempt? <laughs> Anything to do with math. <laughs> what or who is the greatest love of your life? Ooh, I, I gotta go with, uh, well, two. P22 definitely was a great love of my life. And my dog Dante that just passed at 12. Uh, you know, I've, I have five dogs. We have lots of dogs. You have that one dog. He was it. So I've lost two great animal loves in my life this year. It's been really tough. What turns you on spiritually or emotionally? I think the wild world. I just, I love exploring it, being curious about it. Uh, it brings me great peace and joy. It brings me intellectual curiosity. So, you know, wild animals or, or animals, I, I think is what that is all right welcome that was marley having a little fun with our guest beth pratt this is part two of a two-part interview if you missed part one i would encourage you to go back and have a listen to that if you are here in anticipation of our continued conversation with beth pratt well then let's get to it This is the Emerging World Project podcast. What are you doing here? I'm Addison Brown. Today, I'm delighted to introduce you to an exceptional guest who has dedicated her life to making a positive impact on our planet, Beth Pratt. Beth is an acclaimed author, conservationist, and advocate. She is a true force of nature, channeling her passion for wildlife and the environment into transformative action. As the California Regional Executive Director for the National Wildlife Federation, she has led groundbreaking initiatives and tirelessly championed the cause of conservation. Her relentless commitment to protecting our natural world has earned her well-deserved recognition and respect among her peers. Beyond her impressive role at the National Wildlife Federation, Beth is an accomplished author who has captured hearts and minds through her writing. Her work not only educates and inspires readers, but also shines a light on the urgent need to preserve and restore our fragile ecosystems. From the pages of her books, she paints vivid pictures of our natural wonders, urging us to embrace a sense of stewardship and forge a harmonious relationship with the earth. Beth Pratt's advocacy extends far beyond the written word. Through her engaging presentations and impassioned speeches, she sparks a deep sense of connection between people and nature. Her ability to communicate complex environmental issues in a relatable and accessible manner has empowered countless individuals to join the fight for a sustainable future. In today's conversation, 
We'll have the privilege of delving into Beth's remarkable journey. We'll explore the formative experiences that awakened her love for wildlife, delve into the challenges facing our planet, and discover the innovative solutions she champions. In this time when the need for environmental stewardship has never been more pressing, Beth's work serves as a beacon of hope and inspiration. Through her writing, conservation efforts, and advocacy work, she continues to galvanize individuals to take action, reminding us all of our responsibility to safeguard the planet for future generations. Brace yourself for a thought-provoking discussion as we explore Beth Pratt's vision for a world where nature thrives and humanity and wildlife coexist in harmony. On more practical, um, yeah. pragmatic terms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I loved that. Uh, did you watch, uh, not to get too far down this rabbit hole, but I was... Um, <laughs> Watch, I, I love The Last of Us uh, just because, you know, they took a, um, you know, a, a f- fungus that exists already in mm-hmm, nature mm-hmm. and, you know, sort of extrapolated that into a what if, yes. which is not all that implausible, actually, yes. if the climate changes enough to shift and this could jump to humans, which as we're seeing with pandemics, right? It's just one more. Yes. And, um, I just, you know, I love that imagining, but also, you know, again, the, it's always interesting to me on these end of world movies I love is how humans respond. And it, it, that one was interesting because there were so many different approaches to it, right? You had Mm -hmm, these militarized mm -hmm. zones, you had one of the, the, the places, I think it was Jackson hole where it seemed to be almost this you know, um, happy society that was based on fairness. And, you know, so every, mm-hmm, you know, everybody mm-hmm. responds differently to these um, stressors, maybe for lack of a better word. And, uh, it, you know, it's, to me, it's always so interesting. The human response to threat or change um, is just right. very different. It is. And I think we'll always have that. That's why I said uh, uh, through Topia, right? Like yeah. there are plentiful dystopian films, right? Like we yeah. could just, that's all we make. So yeah. this place is, we are at a place where we have to push through and see what are that other imagining is that we're not even imagining. I haven't yeah. been able to get there. And I wonder, yeah. it often is this as minute as fear, right? Yeah. So a deeply what I feel for me was a deeply programmed fear early on that I had to break through and and not just fear of big things, but just safety, just fear of, or, or, or fear of not being here, right? Not so much fear of death, but fear of actually not being here. Like, okay, what is that? Yeah. Like, what is that? And so going down that path to explore it has helped me look at or push the boundary of my own imagination of what this throughtopia could look like, even though I don't know that I'll see it. But we will see the the completion of the Wallace Annenberg wildlife crossing, won't we? <laughs> yes, I know. It's so I mean <laughs> to me that that's on the spectrum of what we're getting at, right? That listen, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it is we are not going back to um you know, the old timey days when mm-hmm. it's just nature, right? I mean, even, you know, I mean, as much as I'd love it, it, it ain't happening. So that's the other thing I think we have to reckon with is, you know, what is this going to look like? How can we make both work, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I was just, I'm working on this book, Yosemite Wildlife, um, just really excited, A, because it's, uh, it's been a long haul working on it and it's, I'm one chapter away from finishing. It'll be out next year. Congratulations. But, um, yeah. Oh, it's very exciting. It's the book I've always wanted to write. I'm very excited. I love but, that. Um, I was talking with Ron, uh, Roland Knapp, who's a, a conservation hero of mine. And, you know, he was very, he was, again, the science raised the alarm bell on the yellow legged frog, mountain yellow legged frogs in, in the Sierra but also knew, you know, came up with the solution, which, you know, at first, obviously the trout introduction, the, is what spelled their doom. And then you get the chitrid fungus, which takes over. And uh, even with these, these mountain yellow frogs, literally almost, 
you know, checking out almost mm-hmm. in my lifetime, almost going extinct. You know, there's some hope now. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he even said, he said to me, which he's right, is like, listen, we're never going to be back to what it was when they were literally ruling the Sierra. Right. You, had, you couldn't even walk in some places. And then again, this is in my lifetime, but that's okay. You right. know, we're going to get, it's better than them not being there. And I think like the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing to me shows that you can still have a 10 lane mm-hmm. freeway with 400,000 mm-hmm. cars a day mm-hmm. and you can still have wildlife. You know, right. to me that commuters will be driving under the structure while a mountain lion will be moving on top shows that back to what we were talking about. I don't quite know this new answer, but it's on that spectrum, right? Mm-hmm. That it's Absolutely. something we haven't thought of yet. Exactly. Right? It's it not here yet. Yeah. 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 And I think that is a good, um, uh, the wallace Annenberg Crossing is a good example of that. And so we right. need to be thinking more like that. It's no longer, you know, it's not this binary either or, it's how can we look at nature together? I think the Japanese are on this too. Although, you know, I spent six weeks in Japan and, you know, again, imperfectly like we all are. I mean, mm-hmm, I'm mm-hmm. not picking on them because we all have terribly complex relationships with nature where we do some good and we do, but you know, they don't see nature as separate that, you know, they, Mm -hmm. and they don't have really religion, but Shintoism is that connection to nature. And I loved, you know, you see all these tree crutches over there and, and, you know, their national parks are so different from ours and that a a city could be a national park, right. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, um, and of course, problematically, they, you know, uh, still hunt whales and things like that. They, they have the indigenous cultures, this sort of, you don't even call it religion. It's just innate in them, this connection to, you know, the natural world in, a, in an almost spiritual way. And um, and so that's where, like, how do we get back to that, right? That, that nature is everywhere. I mean, it, it, just because you're in a city, we've been taught that wasn't nature, but that's not true. It, right. Um, so we're right. getting there. I think the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing is a good example of that and things that inspire. Um, I think people letting, you know, that P-22 could live under the Hollywood sign is a another great example of that. I think the wildlife in some respects are our best teachers. They don't have a problem with it. You know, I mean, P-22 wasn't sitting in Griffith Park longing to be in Yosemite. You know, he just wanted to live and right, he, right. He adapted. It's, he just it's found awesome. himself there, right? Yeah, I mean, they're adapting to our wild spaces: coyotes, bobcats, you name it. It's us who have the hangups, you know. <laughs> right, and 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 it has to do with that. I think again, that sort of uh, limited and sort of micro, the way we w- walk around in our world, you know, in this sort of micro existence, right? It's yeah. like maybe I know the neighbor and maybe two neighbors and maybe I think I might be able to identify one of those trees. But I do think that the more that we know about nature, the, the, the variety, the biodiversity of it, the less we can be so human centric in everything that we do. I agree. And Mm. and, I mean, and the more we know about ourselves, I mean, I just keep coming Mm -hmm. back to, we are nature. We may put ourselves Right. Uh, we think ourselves immune to natural laws, but we're not. I mean, I think right. California being at the ground zero of climate change, you know, whether it be fire or flooding, we can't control this stuff. Uh, and I think that it is our hubris that allows us to think we could. I mean, just this, you know, just this year in California or even where I live, mm-hmm. we had last year the 114 degrees at my house. That's mm-hmm. never happened in 2000 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, and then you run into this winter where I had three feet of snow at my elevation, which is unheard of. Again, it probably hasn't happened since the last ice age. And um, and it had real human impacts. I was trapped in my house for 10 days, no power, mm-hmm. couldn't get out. Mm-hmm. Now I was okay. Mm-hmm. I had a wood stove, I had food, but some people weren't. And, you know, um, it's only going to get worse. And so I think Again, not to doomsay, but I think it is that disconnection from the natural world and not knowing our neighbors and thinking, oh, yeah, you know, the frogs can go extinct. It doesn't impact us. Well, it sure does. You know, right. it, it, it sure does. Right. Mm-hmm. Every, every, every little element. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just the, I wanted to talk about rodenticides, but I'm going to move us into another direction. Sure. Um, although that might come up in terms of advocating for people to connect with nature, which would be wanting people to look at how they're living differently. And so my question to you is what kinds of actions or steps 
can individuals or would you suggest individuals take in their daily lives to foster a stronger bond with our natural yeah. world? Um, you know, I think, you know, first of all, I think just, I think the pandemic, you know, not that there was anything good about it. Um, but what I really was encouraged by during the pandemic is people couldn't go anywhere and they really just got to know their wild neighbors. I, I love, you know, the people building picnic tables for squirrels. And, you know, I mean, it was That's so uh, cool. I, yeah, it was awesome. And I remember this, this cycling, um, blogger, he wasn't much interested in the natural, but he called me up. He's like, he, he wanted to ask, he'd been hearing all this bird song and he's like, did they come back? Or I'm like, no, it's always been there. You just haven't been able to hear it. And I think for a lot of people, um, whether it be sunsets, even me who lives rurally and gets good sunsets, I couldn't believe the sunsets we were getting during the pandemic. Um, I think a lot of people realized what they had been missing and what we had lost. Um, and so I think it gets back to the number one thing you can do is just, you know, meet your wild neighbors even if you just have an apartment balcony, you know, put out some, a bird bath, put out a, you know, a hanging plant and start, start being curious about what is around you. And I think that just then leads to knowledge, which leads to love, which leads to, you know, then taking action. Um, a love of a mountain lion got the world's largest hundred million dollar right. costume built. So and I've seen it time and again, the love of bears when I worked in Yosemite, you know, uh, really changed how uh, the bear management program was approached there. The love of frogs, you know, has, has led to, a, you know, people supporting, uh, uh, there was one frog that the scientists put up, he was the last of his kind and they wanted to try to <laughs> find him a mate, they named him Romero and people's love of frogs got, you know, that that guy mm -hmm. and mate. So time and again, we've seen what love can do and not obviously towards people as well. So I think meeting your wild neighbors, becoming curious is one, but also understanding your impacts and mm -hmm. shift when you can, um, you, you know, rodenticides being a good example. Don't use them. I mean, these poisons, herbicides, they have an inordinate impact in the natural world. Um, recreation is another big rant mm -hmm. of mine these days. And we're just, mm -hmm. You know, there has to be limits. Um, you know, we mm -hmm. tend to think driving is bad and I think everybody gets that and why we're building wildlife crossings, but you know, mountain biking down trails certain times of years can be terrible. And I, again, I have a mountain mm -hmm. bike, I like it, but we just seem to be still not realizing the impact of unlimited recreation. Um, and I think that's something we have to reckon to. There's a trail near me that wanted to expand and you know, it was a, a really important repairing corridor. Right now, it's just, it was sort of this more walking use trail. And they want, they started encouraging mountain biking and uh, oh, wow. much more use without really thinking through it. And of course, you it's an important new migration path. It's an important mm -hmm. repairing corridor. And just our mere human presence can deter animals from getting to the food and shelter and water they need anywhere, not just on this trail. And I think you know, the, this whole notion of connectivity, you know, I've learned so much about that and mm -hmm. working on the crossing, um, you know, swimming in ponds certain time of year can disrupt tadpoles moving back and forth to where they need to be to say nothing of shipping lanes, disrupting whale migrations. So listen, it's not that we can't be human. It's not mm -hmm. that we can't do things we need. But I think, uh, you know, understanding more our impact can help us minimize those impacts. First, do no mm -hmm. harm is what I keep coming back to. And mm -hmm. although I'm a big advocate of bringing green space back to cities, at this point, I don't want to give up one square inch of undeveloped land. I mean, mm -hmm. thing, we have to compromise. Well, I think we have compromised and the natural world has compromised enough. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, simple things like if you put a fence up, well, maybe look at can like a fox get through it so that they can go through your yard right, is it forcing animals right. off the streets so i think just reckoning with our impacts and and trying to minimize those wherever we can is where i'm at these days on how to make a difference yeah i would have to agree i think that also you know dovetails with this need to slow down um yes. our yeah, slow down could be it's such an easy thing such you know, an slow easy down. thing just slow, slow down. down. Slow down. <laughs> just... it, it gives you better reaction time and you can, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. then avoid some collisions with wildlife. So, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And this, our pursuit of our, our need to fulfill certain desires to feel better about ourselves. Now I'm going psychological here, but you know, I, I fall in the realm of wanting to have wanting to climb, you know, Kilimanjaro or, you know, go on extensive hikes. And I, I understand that humans have always wanted to move around. And I wonder again about how much of that is going to be necessary or is even necessary for us to feel some sense of belonging and content and joy in the what's already here, what we've already built in this world. That's right? a great point. I, you know, I, I definitely have seen, for me, a transition has gotten older. Um, I just love my sense of place. I, you know, yeah. I love where I live. I almost yeah. never want to leave it these days, even though I have to. Um, yeah. And I think you're right. I mean, it's not, I mean, traveling is also beneficial, but you know, what we need is here. And mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think paying more attention to our surroundings can bring great joy, whether you're traveling or not. I mean, I, you know, right. I just, I hate flying, not because I'm scared. It's just such a hassle, but what always strikes me when I'm flying and I always get a window seat. So everybody else on the plane has closed their window and you know, they're watching, <laughs> you know, they're watching movies or on their computer. And I'm like, my God, like all the entertainment you need is outside the window. That's like, crazy, like, right? Yeah. How have we got now? Now don't get me wrong. I enjoy a good movie and I, you know, and a good TV series, but, you're on a plane, 30,000 feet above the earth. And I can't imagine a more wondrous thing to look at for a few I hours than. Totally so, yeah, agree. We, you know, why do we need these distractions um, when all we need is really, for the most part, the natural world to bring us that joy and satisfaction? Um, I don't know. Yeah, it, it is, again, I think a, um, something very human. Um, that has gotten out of balance. Again, I mm-hmm. I, I love mm-hmm. movies, but and and I love a lot of the mo- things of the modern world. I'm glad we have vaccines. You know, I'm I'm, mm-hmm. I'm glad um, that I can fly and see my friends three thousand miles away. Where, you know, you know, even fifty, a hundred years ago, if you moved away, you weren't seeing your. Um... So there's a lot I love about the modern world. But how do we balance that with something we've lost, which is a connection to what is so special and joyful on this planet. I think we just, it's like we overcomplicate it, you know? I mean, there's nothing more amazing to me than watching a sunset or bats come out or, and so why is that not fulfilling something in us that it should? I don't know the answer, but yeah, it is is really interesting. I think the the neuroscientists are really starting to delve into this, you know, Mm -hmm. dopamine, um, over dopamine. It's like where, what is the expression I heard? It's like we're a cactus in the forest, you Uh, know, like we just can't get enough. Yep. And so that somehow biologically, neurologically, that is what's happening. It's it's just, it doesn't last long. It's never enough. Yeah. So it's true. Yeah. And something to think about. I had a conversation with, uh, yeah, with a relative of mine and I hope he uh, doesn't listen to this podcast. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he uh uh we were having lunch and he is very stoic and he's a lawyer and so I got that right and I said can you tell me just a little bit he was in Los Angeles I said can you tell me what you're working on he goes I can't you're gonna hate me yeah. I said really he goes yeah I just can't I go please just a little bit he says think about the fires and uh what is it Pacific PG&E or one of the electric companies and the lawsuit and think about what side I'm working for. Oh, oh, gotcha. Yeah. And I just said, and I asked him, I said, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have that conversation with you, but I want to have this conversation about what is enough because I understand what's pushing you is more money, a bigger house, more cars, more um, ability to travel to Abu Dhabi or wherever you want to go. I get that. But are you asking yourself what is enough? And just start to ask yourself, what's enough? Like how big does your house need to be? Right. How many cars do you think you need to drive? That's not to say, because I know his answer is, would be, well, you did it. And it's true. Like I had to go through the phase of over, right. you know, oversaturating my desires. So anyway, I just felt like that was for somebody that was going out into the world to work in the world and make his place in the world, a good question, a good place for him to start about how much he thinks he needs to I think that is a, be a, in a, the I world. Think- 
that's the heart of the issue is how much is enough. And, mm -hmm. and I think it does, again, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Right. But right, right. Um, I think right. you know, one thing like the supply chain issues we have these days really hits me is, yeah, you know, I, we don't need, you know, 150 different right. um, <laughs> kinds of tea to be in stock every <laughs> second. Right. I mean, it, I, I remember early on being like, oh my God, my favorite thing isn't there. And then it, it started hitting me. Well, it's that, my God, you know, we've gotten, we have gotten to a level um, of what is enough that is so beyond the pale that mm -hmm. even I needed, you know, a, a gut check on um, that. Yeah. How much is enough? How much is enough? Um, and, you know, I think what we're also dealing with is, is problems of, of scale, which is, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll give a really minor example of this, um, you know, rock stacking, hugely impactful. Mm -hmm. Um uh, uh, national parks are warning it can impact wildlife. It can change waterways. Yeah. If mm -hmm. one person does it, who cares, but that, that never happens anymore. Right. We, mm -hmm, as our mm -hmm. population keeps exponentially growing, what was okay 50 years ago doesn't work. Right. I mean, like right. national parks are a great example. The, um, you know, I'm a big proponent now of putting uh, visitor limits on it, you know, not, you know, having equal act, equal opportunity for access, but not unlimited access. Cause we're just seeing resource damage. And yeah, when the parks were at, you know, a million visitors or depending on the park, it, you know, you didn't see these impacts. Right. But, mm. you know, it is a matter of scale now, right. That, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that we're grappling with as well. And that's where, yeah, what, what is enough? We may not be able to do things, whether it be buying our specialty tea and having that in stock all the time uh, or visiting our favorite park the way we used to. Yeah. Is that too bad? Sure. But on the other hand, it is where we're at. I think we need to reckon with that, that what is enough. Yeah. Um, what is yeah. Enough? And I, I wonder, yeah, I think that we'll end up be doing less, but we'll find some sort of peace in that. I don't know. I, I have I, never been happier than when I hiked the Muir Trail. It, I was going to ask you what your favorite, if you had any favorite simple, I mean, trails. I, I'm never, these days though, I, I have to say, I do like just, you know, I, I in, in the high country, my happy places above tree line when the pike are mm -hmm, out. And mm -hmm. there is a sense of peace that being out there, everything's simplified. But I'd say through hiking gets you to a, a place that is probably more akin again to human origins, right? We mm -hmm. are you know, we're meant to move, not sit at a computer. We're meant to, you know, we evolved to be this sort of wanderer, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and to move a lot. We're, we're people who walk. We're, um, and yeah, the Muir Trail just, what's great about through hikes, not just the Muir Trail that I've done, is that your existence becomes so simplified. You mm -hmm. walk, you eat, you drink, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. walk the next day, and you look mm -hmm. at things, and it just, it really gets you down to the simplified existence that is very stress-free. You're also very reliant on yourself. Um, yeah. And yeah. I think it, it gets back to more akin to, you know, going back thousands of years to our human, the, what our human existence used to be like, which I'm not advocating for going back. Again, I like being able to see a Star Wars, but yeah, how do we get back to a balance of that where we don't have a million friggin' choices every day, where we don't right. have, um, we, we are at least a little more physical, right? Um, I don't, again, I don't have a magic answer, but I do think there is a happiness in, in less choice than more. Um, I agree. And I liked it when there were just like maybe two different tomatoes <laughs> yeah exactly or, or god i grew up in a time where you had three different um tv channels and that was it and you know i can't even keep up these days um we might be dating ourselves here but yeah know. exactly but yeah there, i think the notion listen nature is very complex so mm -hmm. but on the other hand i think a simplicity in existence is what nature is geared towards. And mm, I think that's mm. where humans, again, getting back to what is it in humanness that is our, you know, our, our, where we went wrong. I think it's overcomplicating things. I yeah. Think that's yeah. probably our, our kryptonite, right? We just overthink things. If anything, yeah. perhaps our intellect is what is going to yeah. do us in, which is interesting. 
Yeah, I, 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 I've been feeling that way for a, a long time now. Um, uh, I also was going to tell you that I'm going to be talking to Warren Dixon down the line, and we didn't get to. Oh God, to... my buddy Warren. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and I. So I'm going to save any questions. I'll give them to him. That I was going to kind of combine the the issues uh, with those communities that are well, you know, again connected. It is, and and that's I think someone just asked me about. We just did this talk on the crossing at that conference I told you about in. Um, somebody stood up in the audience and it was the ultimate compliment, you know, even more than building the crossing, which was my God, look at your, you know, we brought like Warren and others who had helped mm-hmm. us. And they said, we are just amazed. You have indigenous people and black and brown people. Like mm. you, it's such an inclusive movement. Like, how did you do that? And it, it really threw me. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know mm-hmm. how to answer that question. And I think it is about listening and being inclusive and, and knowing that you don't have all the answers. And Warren's such a piece of that. I met him, you know, uh, he was my driver the first year and he started learning about P22 and he was a hip hop artist as well. Um, and he said something so profound to me and another person might've taken offense, right? I'm not holding mm-hmm. myself up as special. Cause I've, it's really not, I've just kind of always been this way, but, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and you wonder why other people get afraid of difference. Me, it's like, wow, that's, but he talked about, he went to an, uh, you know, I pulled him into some event that first year I met him and you know, you had this person whose goats had been killed by a mountain lion, yet she was hosting this fundraiser to help the wildlife crossing because, you know, she still loved mountain lions. And we get in the car and he's like, that was so strange. He's like, you white people are crazy. You know, he's like, how do we get you to love black people like Mm -hmm. I was like, Mm -hmm. wow, that's so powerful. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, we started Mm -hmm. becoming friends and he made the connection to P22 in such a way that we ended up, and you can talk about this, if I was wild challenge, which is really powerful that to him and to the community of Watts, which I've spent a lot of time in now, it's an amazing community. They see P22 as analogous to themselves. You know, Mm -hmm. Warren said, said to me once that, you know, I'm a black man who made it out just by luck of Watts. I mean, I could have, you know, very easily not because of the system was stacked against me. And he's mm-hmm. like, P22 is the same way. The system mm-hmm. was stacked mm-hmm. against mm-hmm. them. Most mountain lions don't make it out. And we, mm-hmm. and so for both of us, we need to change the system. And beautiful. Boy, that just made. That is really powerful. Yeah. Very powerful. Yeah. And yeah. So anyway, yeah, I'm glad you're talking to him. I love Warren. He's, he's great. Yeah, I think it's a a great combination. I I want to backtrack and 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 say and speak to the the inclusiveness um too that sometimes evaded my understanding of why I wouldn't do that anyway. So I talk to some people from all over the globe and I forget and it's not that I forget their uh, anybody else's story. I understand it and I am empathetic and I feel those stories. But as a human being, and as being as someone that is so immersed in understanding of my interconnectedness and my interrelationship with the natural world, I do often forget that it needs to happen, right? Yeah. That I have to make that happen. I have to make sure that mm-hmm. that there's youth in these conversations, right. that there's all types of people from all over the world in this. We can't go back from being global. We already are. Right. Right. But um, I have to be sensitive to uh, remember to do that because it's easy to forget because it feels so good not to have to think that that's what the big problem is. Right. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, just, I think I think for, you know, I mean, it's not unique to conservation or to even this campaign, but it's just, you know, listening and empowering. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I feel mm-hmm. like that is the key to. um making people feel welcome and realizing that your perspective is not the only one. I mean, it's, it's now sometimes you have to make some calls. Obviously we're not going to um, bring somebody in the movement who thinks it's okay to, you know, um, slaughter wildlife. You know what I mean? There are, there are moral, moral lines to be drawn, but on the other hand, people's different perspectives are so valuable and indeed enriching. And again, it makes us, I don't know. I, I, people like Warren have made me a better person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
And that I love that connectivity, you know, is 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 broader than the way that we use it when we talk about conservation, right? We exactly. talk about yeah. connectivity is so important to nature. It is it is nature. It thr- nature thrives on connectivity. That's that isolation that we're yes trying to uh, dis that we've created, right? Needs connectivity, and then you think about us within that too. Us being humans, the connectivity, right? Like. Of course, during the pandemic, we discovered that so profound, I think so profoundly, like, yes. wow, yeah. like, and, and holy I think it moly. Is, it's a natural lesson. I mean, as someone who spends a lot of time out in nature observing wildlife, um, you know, we tend to think of the natural world as sort of this cutthroats, you know, where the the, pre- the predators prey on the prey all the time. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. But it's not. I mean, you no. see, um, the, the natural world is so connected where people like the pika I study, they, the sort of landscape they live on these talus slopes, you have multiple species interacting and, and helping each other from mm-hmm. like a raptor flies overhead, the ground squirrels, the pika, the marmots, <laughs> all in the birds will all sort of band together with these early warning systems, right? Um, you also have predator and prey sometimes just working it out right they're not always out there on the hunt and um, right right at, uh, humpback whales who can be you know they've seen them be altruistic um so i think you know i think what again except for us humans uh the natural world realizes how you know connected they are um and that it is a connected landscape of cooperation even those who sometimes eat each other um so yeah, I, I do. I'm with you. I, I've come to absolutely believe that as well, that this connectivity has a real, that we've lost that. And that's what the rest of nature, ha- you know, the rest of the, the natural world hasn't that we're a part of. And I do think that is a lesson for us, again, not just in this very scientific de- definition of connectivity and, and restoring it by like building wildlife crossings, but our own psychological bar, you know, uh, um, loss of connectivity to each mm-hmm. other and to mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it's, it's everything absolutely mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah that helping helping out and also uh, um i lost it because you said it earlier but now i've lost it okay so <laughs> pardon me no worries um uh is there anything you would like me to ask you that i haven't asked you or you haven't been asked no, I, I you, wonderful questions. It was great uh, musing with you. Um, I just, I, I think it, you know, almost everything we've talked about gets it. What I think is that we, you know, we just need this connection to the wild world to be human and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and for the human race to persist, which at this point I'm, I'm, although I'm a hopeful person, not all that hopeful about it, <laughs> but, but I, I do think if people can recognize that we may be on the start to this new paradigm that, we don't know what it is yet, but, um, but we may be able to get there. Um, yeah. You know, Bill Clinton said once, there's nothing wrong with America that what's right with America can't fix. And I almost mm-hmm. believe that about us as humans. Um, I think there's a lot wrong with us, all humans, but what is right with us could get us to that place of reconnection. I, I do believe that we at least have the ability we may not have the will or the desire, but we at least have the ability. <laughs> I I absolutely agree. I think it's a it's a if we look at all the problems, it's a whack a mole thing. Yeah. But if we look at right, like we're just whacking, you know, and that it, that's fine. We don't need any new organizations per se. We can come together with the organizations that are already doing some monumental work, such as mm-hmm. these wildlife crossing and and things like that. But to that point in terms of people looking at themselves and how they can be involved and do something is to, is to let themselves hear what nature is saying. Just let yourself, just let yourself hear it. And I think that the curiosity of that will spark some sort of something within us. That's the imbrication that I think is what we've forgotten or what we're yeah. not tapped into, but it's there. It is absolutely there. It also makes me think about this. After every extinction, things come back more beautiful in more numbers, in more diversity. 
So if we are indeed on this path, then what is the beauty that we can come into, right? Like what is, what is the new butterfly, right? Or the new, what is it? Like to think of it that way, right? So people talk about the best version of myself, right? So we can think about this new iteration as a better version of, of humanity. Yeah, exactly. And, I think, you know, if we survive this and I think if we survive, <laughs> yeah, the difference between the last extinctions obviously is, you know, uh, we are the asteroid, right? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yes, I agree. I mean, almost a psychological extinction for us. What, what, what is the new, what does it mean to be human that's new? I agree. I think there could be something very beautiful in that if, if we can get there. Yeah. 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 Shift in consciousness. Yep. Cores, the pull of remembering back to the center of time, back to the center over and through and back by way of the middle again, spiritual pathways, a promise delivered, a navel formed by the crisscrossing lines tracing the adventures, the joys, the frights, Highlighting the heart, emphasizing the soul, memorializing the memory itself, tracing the adventures, the joys, the frights, the hopes, the fears, the lines of the stars, passages, ribbons, spiritual pathways, land constellations, a promise delivered, ribbons, Ribbons becoming bows, markings of sacred journeys traced over and over and over again. Corridors. Our way of stitching back together that which in our utterly confused clumsiness we have torn all the way apart. Overstitch, understitch, cross stitch, back stitch. A way to repair, to apologize, to do over, to extend our young hand in remorse. Back stitch, overstitch, understitch, cross stitch. A heartfelt prayerful way to repair, a hopeful way to repair, of threading back together, of coming back together, of stitching back together, that which we realize has always been meant to live as one. Carnivores Paradoxical kin, the ones who with a single leap take the lives of those so very close to us in order to feed themselves, in order to feed their young. And also the guardians of life, guardians of life all around us, of our kin, who eat plants, of the plant kin themselves, and even of the rich and fertile soil which births them. Keepers of balance, teachers of elegance, puma, jaguar, panther, imposing reflections of our very own power, inviting us to retract to fully retract our arms, to tread with the lightest of toes, keeping silence, holding reverence, a caress for the land with each step, a caress for the land with each purr. Puma, Jaguar, Panther, 
imposing reflections of our very own power, inviting us to know the fullness of our most unabashed roar. When it's time to be known, when it's time to be present, when it's time to offer nothing but our most preciously primal protection. The Emerging World Project Studios recognizes that we occupy land in Los Angeles County originally and still inhabited and cared for by the Tongva, Tataviam, Serrano, Quiche, and Chumash peoples. We honor and pay respect to their elders and descendants, past, present, and emerging, as they continue their stewardship of the lands and waters in Los Angeles County. Thank you for tuning in to the Emerging World Project podcast, What Are You Doing Here? We hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoy creating it for you. If you found value in today's episode, we would love for you to take a moment to leave us a review on your preferred podcast platform. Your feedback not only helps us improve, but also helps others discover our show and join our community. So please don't be shy. Leave us a review and let us know what you think. We read every review and your input truly means the world to us. To find out more about what the Emerging World Project is up to, head on over to emergingworldproject.org.